We unlock our greatness by working on the hard things. Hello, and welcome to the Psychology Podcast. Today, we welcome Michael Bungay Stanier on the show. Michael is the founder of Box of Crayons and is the author of the best selling book, The Coaching Habit, with over a million copies sold. He was a Rhodes Scholar and in 2019 was named the number one thought leader in coaching. Michael has a master's degree in philosophy from Oxford, a law degree, and a BA with highest honors from the Australian National University. His latest book is called How to Begin. I invited Michael on the show because I'm a big fan of his work in coaching, and as I get more into the coaching profession, everyone seems to be talking about Michael. (laughs) He's just such a good guy, and he's funny and really thoughtful about coaching principles. In this episode, I talked to him about how to begin. When we set goals, the most popular framework that often comes to mind is the idea of SMART goals. Instead of starting with what's measurable, though, Michael urges us to start with what's important. He shares his criteria for identifying what a worthy goal is, as well as advice for how to stay committed to that worthy goal. We also touch on the topics of coaching, empathy, change, and community. So without further ado, I bring you Michael Bungay Stanier. How are you? Nice to meet you in person, Lars. I've been looking forward to this for so long. Me too, actually. Me too. And I'm wearing your shirt as well. (laughs) That is an outstanding shirt. Thank you. I wore it uh, just for this occasion. Well, you know, I I don't feel like I get trumped on shirts very often, but I feel like I've been trumped and I have nothing. I, I doff my imaginary cap to you. <laughs> Where do you live now? I live in Toronto, Canada. Like I'm Australian oh. originally, but okay. um, left Australia 30 years ago and wandered around England for a bit and then the US for a tiny bit. And then 20 years ago, 21 years ago, I guess, came up here. We're literally, uh, we're literally like four days away from celebrating the box of crayons the company i founded it's our 20th birthday in, in on july 4th so i'm pretty amazed about that because i'm not a natural entrepreneur and to have a company that's somehow 20 years old and still doing good in the world is is surprisingly wonderful yeah huge congratulations T- tell people a little bit about what is box of crayons so box of crayons is a uh, it's a learning and development company that has a focus of helping cultures and people move from advice driven to curiosity led. And the way we practically do that is we give managers and leaders and contributors the skills to be more coach-like in the way that they interact with the people around them and they lead their teams. For years, I've, I had felt that coaching was this really powerful technology that mm. just wasn't making much impact in organizations because it was all a bit woo-woo and a bit touchy-feely and a bit life coaching and a bit kind of uh, unattached to the the busy realities of a, of a manager and she's trying to make stuff happen. She doesn't have time for the come down and hang out on my, my therapy couch and we'll do coaching together. I was very driven to kind of unweird coaching and just make it an everyday way of showing up and being with each other with curiosity at the heart of it. Hmm. I love that. You've been at this game a long time, <laughs> you know, and so like, let's go back to this fifties here. Uh, when, when did you, where did you get your, who did you train with? Who are some of your mentors yeah. in the field yeah. or people that just inspired you? Yeah. Well, I, you know, honestly, I got my first sense of what this is about when I was a teenager, because I would find myself in conversations with my teenage friends and, you know, they're full of the usual angst of teenagerhood and I and I just would notice that I was a pretty good listener to people I'd be you know sitting somewhere and be listening to them unfolding their tale of woe and I had this moment going I do not know whether this is helpful or not and whether I'm getting in in everybody's way by doing this and or or whether this is actually you know helping move the things along so I went to my local um, youth crisis counseling something called Youthline um, in Canberra in Australia where I grew up and so I got trained to be a crisis counselor as a teenager so kind of a classic Rogerian training fundamentally being taught there's more to their answer than you think (laughs) and don't trust their first answer it's just the start of a conversation and don't rush in with advice because being present to them is actually part of what's powerful and so I spent quite a few years in my university years doing crisis counseling and then moved into the world of consulting and 
that was when coaching was becoming a thing. You know, I was in London at the time. I was looking over the, the ocean and there's just a rise of coaching in California. And, of course, if you're in London, you're like, it's probably woo-woo hippie stuff. <laughs> we're, we're, we're skeptical, <laughs> cynical Londoners now. We don't really believe in that. But I was, I was intrigued. And I started talking to some of my consulting clients as, maybe I'm coaching you. Maybe this is what this is. And then when I moved to Toronto in uh, 2001, um, I trained with CTI, the Coach Training Institute, mm -hmm. and built a practice and then realized, funnily enough, I didn't actually love coaching. <laughs> it was a real shock because <laughs> I was like, oh, my goodness, I, th I really thought this is everything my life had been leading up to was mm -hmm. this, this kind of moment of building a coaching practice. But I realized I, was, I, I wanted to have a little more impact than that. And actually, I'm better as a teacher and better as a provocateur rather than being a coach yes. or at least having a coaching practice. So I shifted my focus a bit after that. Oh, I love that. And you, well, you wrote this book, The Coaching Habit. So you obviously love at some point teaching coaching to yeah. other aspiring coaches. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, well, it was part of the mission to unweird coaching. And I was actually trying to teach coaching to people who weren't coaches. If you're in the inner circle, and I'm, I was part of this for sure, where you're already a coach, you've, you've already, you've already <laughs> subscribed to the faith and you're like, I love coaching. It's amazing. I'm all in for it. I self-identify as a coach. Well, there's everybody else who's like, I don't know, coaching, it's a bit, I don't get it. It's a bit black box. It's a bit mysterious. I'm not sure if it's really for me. And those are the people I really wanted to write the coaching habit for. People who uh, had this very clear vision in my, my mind. It'd be like a person would walk into an airport bookstore. Um, she would flick through the books there. She'd pick up the coaching habit and she'd go, oh, I could probably read this on a flight. And it would just say, look, here are, here's what coaching is. It's staying curious a little bit longer rushing to action and advice a little more slowly. It's seven good questions. And if you know how to start building that into a habit, so you do it more rather than less, that's actually going to shift the way that you lead and you interact with people. I love that. In a way, you kind of put the source code of coaching there. Like, do you ever fear all these coaches that aren't accredited at all, but they call themselves coaching and charge like millions of dollars, you know, like yeah. they'll get mad at you. They're like, you make, you're telling them it's too easy, you know, like you're kind of, you know. You know? <laughs> like I'm the pen and teller of, of the yeah. coaching world, uh, revealing yeah. the secrets. Yeah, exactly. It's like a magician. I love that. Yes. It's like a magician yeah. saying, oh, don't tell, you know, we're supposed to keep yeah. that to our ICF accredited program. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, I quite excited if that's what I'm doing doing because I think there's a lot of I think there's a lot of artificial mystery around what coaching is and at the same time I think there is skills of being a coach that do take time and they do take training and they do take presence and they do take experience and nuance mm -hmm. and I can see the world of coaching the number of coaches shrinking and the quality of coaches increasing because I do think um, there's a way that soon our AIs in our home, you know, Siri or whoever, will coach us. You know, I'll, I'll sit in my office and I'll go, hey, Siri, can you coach me? And Siri will go, sure, Michael. Um, you know, it's been a week since you last asked for coaching, but what's on your mind? And I'll go, oh, blah, 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 blah. And Siri will go, right, yeah, you talked about that before. W what's the real challenge here for you, Michael? And I'll be like, ah, oh, blah, 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 blah. And she goes, exactly, what, and what else? And it, I think it can be script-led, uh, informed by, by AI, because a lot of what coaching is, is creating the space to think and the mm. space to be heard. And um, you don't need super magic tricks for that. You need the discipline to shut up, <laughs> to ask a good question and shut up and listen to the answer. And AI is excellent at that. Um, mm. And the the discipline to try and be present with the other person and actually ai can do that really well as well and i think a lot of the time you don't really need a coach you just need the structure of coaching to help you make progress and i think there are times where you do need a, a wise guide a wise teacher a wise provocateur and that's something that probably ai can't get to and i think there's a bunch of people out there trained or even you know not formally accredited who are wonderful coaches for that Oh yeah, for sure. The, the the human element is is important. I don't know how the value you see of empathy, 
in coaching. You know, some people kind of think you should keep your emotions out of it. Coaches differ so much and so widely in their own style, their own personal style. It's hard to kind of standardize humans. So my... My thought, I mean, you can empathize at two different levels, I suspect. One is you can kind of empathize with the situation. It's like, oh, my God, I've, I've been there. I've done it. I know what you mean. Oh, it's awful, isn't it? And I don't think you need much of that um, mm-hmm. because, you know, most of the people I've ended up coaching when I've kind of ad hoc done coaching, I've, t- I've never done something like they did. I mean, I one of the great culminating moments of my professional experience was um, we've been using our training in Microsoft and being a kind of key part of their shift from a know-it-all culture to a learn-it-all culture, you know, led by Satya Nadella. And a few years ago at their big sales conference in Las Vegas, I coached their then head of sales on stage in front of 5,000 Microsoftians, if that's the right word. It was great. Wow. It was so exciting. And, um, and so I'm just asking uh, JP some of these questions. And I'm, I'm talking about it because he talks about it freely on his podcast and stuff, so I know it's not mm-hmm. kind of confidential. And um, I've never been a head of sales. And, I, you know, I've done sales for my tiny company, and I was terrible at it. So I'm like, I know nothing mm-hmm. about the sales thing. I know nothing about what it means to lead an organization of 180,000 people. But what I do have empathy for is the human being. Mm-hmm. And... Martin Buber talks about two types of relationships, I-it relationships and I-thou relationships. Um, I-it relationships, you know, they're kind of more transactional and you kind of lose a little bit of humanity in the exchange. And I-thou relationships when you're present to the other person. And I think that one of the things that coaching can do is to be empathetic and present to the humanity of the other person so i think that does involve emotion and i'm not i'm you know i'm classic over intellectual straight white guy i'm not actually that great at being connected to my emotion but i really try to go you know that sounds hard or that sounds exciting or i'm thrilled or i'm disappointed or i can feel how sad you are that that doesn't require any expertise it just requires a willingness to be human in the moment. Mm, I love it. Being human in the moment. That's a good title, yeah. book title. Maybe maybe not a good book title. But I like it. A good quote. A good quote. Well, your your latest book is called How to Begin, Start Doing Something That Matters. Mm. Uh, it's it's way it's about way, way more than that. But it gets them in the door. It gets them yes. in the door <laughs> to begin and then they realize, wow, this is also how to like finish as well. <laughs> That's it. Oh yeah. So let's talk about SMART goals. In the field of positive psychology, the phrase SMART goals is uh, everywhere, right? Yeah. Um, and uh, you say SMART goals are dumb. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, you say that uh, what I know you mean is SMART goals can be dumb. But can, yeah. you, um, can you elaborate a little bit more on that provocative sure. statement, Mr. Yeah. Provocateur? <laughs> I know. I've got that, I've got whatever it is, that wiring in my brain, which is like, how do I wind people yeah, up too. a little bit? Me too. Um, me too. You know, you got to, it's like make them curious before you actually start teaching them yes. anything. And, and, and I'm just trying to ra- raise some eyebrows. So mm-hmm. I started writing this new book, How to Begin. And it wasn't meant to be a book about goals. It was meant to be an, another attempt to try and crack what does it take to change individual behavior? Because, you know, that's the goal for so much of us, which is like, how do I shift and how do I be differently and act differently so I can, I can grow as a person? And Anybody who's tried any of that ever, just like everybody listening to this podcast goes, it's hard. It is so hard to shift human behavior. I'm like, all right, I'm going to try and see if I can write another book to try and illuminate some corner of that. I wrote a draft of it, sent it out to some friends, and one wrote back immediately going, I've read, some, I've read 60 pages of your first draft. This is a terrible book. I don't even know what it's about, and I've read the first 60 pages. I was like, oh. But he said, look, there's one phrase I really like. We unlock our greatness by working on the hard things. Mm. And that felt resonant and powerful. We unlock our greatness by working on the hard things. So then the question came to me, which is like, so how do you figure out what the hard things are for you to put your attention to? Not only so you can do the hard things, but that you can unlock your greatness as part of that. And that's what took me to, well, how do you set the goal? How do you find the target for yourself? And then suddenly I went you know what, I've been talking about or being taught smart goals for 
the 30 years of my career, it's not just in positive psychology that this is a thing, it's everywhere. That's true. Honestly, I'll That's go true. into a crowd and I go, what's the one word you associate with goals? And the crowd yells back in unison, smart goals. And I'm like, exactly. And then I go, who knows goals? what? Well, who knows? This is the thing. Who knows what SMART goals stand for? Because it's an acronym. What are the five yeah, words? And everyone's yeah, like, yeah. Um, yeah, I, ooh. <laughs> and, and all sorts of words come out. And here's one of the things about SMART goals. This is the kind of the surface irritation. Nobody can quite remember what the acronym stands for. They, they, it's, it's like trying to remember the seven dwarfs. You can make good progress on four of them. You, have, you think you got the fifth one. You have no idea what the sixth and the seventh one are. I don't know, I don't know what they're called. And the answer is bashful, by the way. That's the one nobody can ever remember. So one of the things about SMART goals is, and I've seen the table of this, there's like three or four, maybe five actual credible alternatives for every single letter in the acronym. Mm. But here's the real irritation for me around SMART goals. Most of what that is about is about tidying them up. It's about making them neat and making them containable, making them specific, making them measurable, and there is a place for all of that. And when that is the place that you start, if you don't have the right goal, it doesn't matter how smart the goal is. I mean, you know, I always say it's like polishing a turd. It just doesn't help uh -huh. to, 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 to do that. So I wanted to give people a framework of uh, how to think about a goal that actually was like how do you find the right goal how do you find something that is important to you important to the world will help you learn and grow and then there's a place for tidying up once you get clear on what that goal is but we when you start with smart goals you're you're, you're starting with the, how do we measure this rather than what matters i get the point that you were making and yes. i think you know it'd be good to, to outline for people what a worthy goal is you talk about thrilling, important, and daunting. And yeah. as my um, mentor, Abraham Maslow, put it, what's not worth doing is not worth doing well. That's his version <laughs> of you can't polish a turd and, you know, get something exactly. better than a turd. That's that, that's Maslow's version of it. Yeah. I love that. You know what? I haven't heard that before, but, you know, Drucker says the same thing. You know, it's like there's nothing uh, worse yeah. than doing really efficiently the thing that should never be done at all. So, yes. I, so when you think about a worthy goal, I'm like, okay, so if smart's not going to do it for me, what what what's my take on it? How do you how do you build a goal that has a resilience and a resonance and a power that will keep people going on it? Because one of the things that I knew to be true about myself and true about other people that I bumped into or coached was there's a lot of abandoned goals. <laughs> there's a lot of I'm going to do this and then. <laughs> You know, New Year's resolutions are the most obvious case in point, but there's just a lot of kind of, you know, there's a there's a graveyard of good intentions that haven't been followed through on. So how do you create something that has a, a power and a, and a clarity and something that has intrinsic and extrinsic motivation so that you're more likely to stick to it when things get hard? Yes. And so just as you said, I'm like, I think – there are three elements to it, thrilling and important and daunting. So let me just explain what each of those are. Thrilling, Great. really good place to start. It's like what, what get, lights you up? What gets you excited? What speaks to who you are now and who you want to be when you grow up? You know, what makes you kind of rub your hands together and go, that would be pretty cool. I don't even really understand what it's all about, but I can feel the kind of quickening of my blood when I think about that as yes. a possibility. And it's a really great place to start. And one of the things about focusing on thrilling is it is a countermeasure against obligation because a lot of us inherit our goals. We're like, you know what, whether it's an explicit thing like at work you're told what to do or more often it's a kind of internally learned story. You know, when I'm this person at this age doing this thing, I really should be doing this. I really should be doing that. It really, this should be the next thing. And you're like, oh, my heart sinks a little bit when I think about it, but it feels like the thing I should do. When you start with thrilling, you're like, forget that. Just do the thing that makes you kind of, you know, quickens your blood a little bit. But it, I don't think it can be just about thrilling, or at least the goals I want to help people set aren't just about what you want. I want them to, in some way, serve the world. You know, Jacqueline Novogratz, uh, author of a wonderful book called A Manifesto for a Moral Revolution. Um, she has a TED talk about this as well. She has a wonderful phrase in this book. She says, what if we could give more to the world than we take? 
And I think that is a magnificent call to action. What could we give more to the world than we take? That, I, I just think, if I could help more people do that, that makes our world a better place. Now, sometimes your goals are going to be in the context of the work that you do, and sometimes it's just in the context of the life that you live. But important is all about saying, how does this go beyond me and what I want? How does this contribute some way to the bigger picture? Mm-hmm. Now, what's interesting is thrilling and important have a tension with each other. They're not additive yeah. to each other. They're in, they're in a complex relationship with each other. And the excitement is in the tension. The excitement is figuring out what's the best tension between them. And I think one of the things about a SMART goal is they tend to be additive. Let's make it specific and measurable and additive. Whereas I always think the more interesting systems are where you've got a few principles that are trying to find the right balance against each other. So thrilling and important. And then the final one is daunting. And daunting is how does this keep you learning and growing? How does this take you to the edge of who you are and invite you further along the path? I mean, you know, the, the saying, you can't teach an old dog new tricks. You know, when I was younger, I was like, maybe that's true. But now I'm like, now I'm kind of getting to be an old dog. And I'm like, damn it, you can teach an old dog new tricks. And I will keep learning. and I will keep growing. And, you know, you'll know the you'll know the literature better than me, which is, that you know, one of the true indicators of aging well is a willingness to keep learning. So how mm. do you keep growing? Because yeah. it's actually, you can imagine a worthy goal, which is thrilling and important. But it actually is no longer daunting. It kind of keeps you busy. It keeps you fulfilled, but it also keeps you plateaued. You're no longer yes. kind of finding the edge of, of who you are and who you might be. Yes. And I think what you're looking to do is articulate a goal for yourself. And this is a big goal. This is not just, you don't have 12 of these. You have, this is the goal that I want to put time and attention to. And you're looking to fine tune the best combination of thrilling and important and daunting for you. Yeah, yeah, and any of these three can come apart. What if you're a thrill seeker and uh, you get bored really easily with something? You're like, yeah, this is important and daunting, but I've lost the thrill for it, you know? And yeah, that can be tough for a lot of people who say that they, oh, I'm doing something important and daunting. What more would I want? And they kind of, they could feel guilty that it's not thrilling. Right. You know what I mean? Right, I do. And the other thing, if, if you're doing important and daunting, but not thrilling, meaning it doesn't speak to who you are, mm. I feel that that's a, sh- a short path to burnout. I mean, there's mm. a lot of people who are uh, doing really significant work. Um, you know, they're like, they're making the world better. It's they're stretching them and it is exhausting them. And because there's none of that kind of internal feeding that happens because they, they're being nourished by the work that they're doing, it is just it's just exhausting and it, that's only sustainable for so long yeah yeah well that's that's very true uh, it also gets at the harmonious passion versus obsessive passion distinction in positive psychology and volume i don't work. know i don't know that um distinction yeah harmonious passion is when uh, what we're engaging in really feels in line with who we are um, really passionate about it in a way that doesn't burn us out and we know when to stop and we're flexible to move on to other things in life. But obsessive passion is something we do almost compulsively and mm. feel like we have to do it and it that's does lead helpful. to burnout very quickly. Yeah. Yeah. That's really helpful. I, I didn't know the distinction, but I, I, that immediately shines some lights on stuff. I get that. Wonderful. Wonderful. Um, and so you say the magic's in the drafting. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. What does that mean? What does that mean? Well, look, when I wrote The Coaching Habit, I'll, I'll get to an answer here, but just a, a minor detail. In The Coaching Habit book, there are seven questions. Mm. And one of the questions is the focus question. And the focus question is, so what's the real challenge here for you? And the power of that question is it says the first challenge that shows up is never the real challenge. It's never the only challenge. So stay curious as to what the real challenge is, because if you're able to go, look, I'm trying to figure out what what's the real thing that needs to be solved or figured out or worked on here, that is the powerful intervention, figuring out what the real challenge might be. And the key learning there is be patient, be curious, and don't accept the first answer as the real answer. And so often we, we, get, we get seduced into thinking that the first answer is the real answer, and it, it rarely is. I think the same can be said about goal setting. 
And I think one of the reasons that goal setting can be disheartening for people and a bit disappointing is often it's a it's a, a one and done first draft. Okay, that's pretty good, and I'll go with that. And I'm a big fan of the you know the so-called where well, you can use SFD. So something first draft. You can use whatever word you want for the S. You know the the family friendly one is stormy or or um, I like Anne Lamott. She says crappy first draft, and that's what I tend to go with. It's like, look, your first draft. Just assume it's a crappy first draft. And I can tell you know we we are both writers. We've both written books. We know that like we and we're pretty good writers. And our first draft is always a bit crappy. It's always a bit disappointing. This idea of trying to take what's in your brain and then you put it down on paper and you're like, oh my goodness, that's nothing. That's nothing like the genius thing that's in my head. And it takes writing and rewriting to make it strong and tight and, and crisp and kind of resonant. And I just want people to go, look, your, your first draft, brilliant start, but it's crappy. And that's, that's the paradox. A crappy first draft is the perfect start. And I want people to say, look, a second and then a third draft will shift your worthy goal. So you need yeah. to have some structures to actually go, here's how you work it and rework it to actually get a goal that is optimized for thrilling, important, and daunting for you. You say before you move on to action, you have to understand what it means to commit. And you're saying mm -hmm. it's not just saying yes to a worthy goal. What else is it? The How to Begin book has kind of three parts to it. The first part is about how do you figure out the worthy goal? So what scale do you play at? How do you find it thrilling, important, and daunting? How do you move through a drafting process so you end up with something that feels pretty good for you? And if you get there and you're like, I've got a worthy goal and I like it, it's kind of, it's, 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 it's got my engine ticking over nicely. The temptation is to launch into action. Mm. And I think this is... Um, where sometimes we, we just move a little too quickly and a, a, a pause and a reflection on what it truly means to commit can be really powerful. And, you know, the hmm. work that's really influenced me on this is the book uh, Immunity to Change. I don't know if you know that work. I've um, never heard of it. Uh, so Bob Keegan and Lisa Leahy, um, mm. who are educational psychologists at Harvard, and they have a debt in their work to a leadership writer called Ron Heifetz, who talks mm -hmm. about technical change versus adaptive change. And this is my attempt to build on that work and try and make it a little more accessible and simpler to it. Here's the metaphor that I heard first from Bob Keegan and Lisa Leahy. Sometimes we're trying to make progress and we've got our foot on the accelerator. What we don't realize is at the same time we have our foot on the brake. And until you actually go, how do I take my foot off the brake? It doesn't matter how hard you're pumping the accelerator, you're not going to make progress. So how do you figure out what the brake is and whether you've got your foot on the brake or not? Mm -hmm. And what they're really talking about is, do you understand how committed you are to maintaining the status quo? Because I think one of the things that's become really apparent as I wrote this book and I thought through my own knowledge of change and change management is we are far more committed to the status quo than we realize. Even as we're frustrated, even as we're irritated, stressed, overwhelmed, railing against it, we're, we're getting something from it. And there's a way that we're maintaining something that gives us something in return. So this is what commitment means to me. You ask yourself two big questions. The first is this, you've identified your worthy goal. And the first question you ask yourself is this, let's say I said no to this worthy goal. You know, I've walked all the way up to it and now I walk back from it and I'm going, I'm not going to do it. What are the prizes and punishments of that decision? What's the prizes? What do you get from not taking on this worthy goal? And what you'll discover is what you get is you get to maintain predictability and status and expectations of yourself and expectations other people have you and the relationships and money and time. There's a bunch of stuff that doesn't get put at risk. You get to maintain the way things are just as they are. But what the price you pay for not taking on your worthy goal is manifold. It's what you imagine the impact of your worthy goal would be. It's what I would get as being part of the, 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 the world around your worthy goal. It's about not having that impact that you dream of, not having that thrilling, important, daunting thing that you wanted to work on. 
And that's really powerful. And that doesn't get done very often, which is this idea of how committed am I to the status quo? What's at risk if I take this on? And that's kind of the next variation on the question. Now imagine fully committing to doing this worthy goal. You're like, I am up for it. I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm pushing all my chips into the center of the table here I'm going for. First of all, what are the prizes of doing that? What's the prizes of pursuing this? And you can imagine that the impact and the nourishment and the success and the growth for you, but also what's at risk? What's at risk if you fully commit to this? And there will be a price that will get paid. There is stuff at risk. And a lot of it is how you see yourself and how others see you and where you're putting your time and money and effort and energy. And it's really about weighing up the consequences of making the choice. That's what I mean by making the commitment. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. My friend uh, Mark Manson um, calls it about not giving a fuck uh, so that you can have fucks to give for the things that you care about. It's his general <laughs> idea. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. I think that, that's exactly right. This is what I found so powerful about um, Ron Heifert's work about adaptive change mm. versus technical change. Sometimes we're naive about how change happens. Because I think there are two types of change. Technical change, or as I put it, talk about it in the book, simple change, uh, sorry, easy change, is a kind of additive process. You know, you're like, I need to figure something out. So you listen to a podcast and you watch a YouTube and you read a book and you practice a bit and you're not that good to start off with, but then you do it again and you're better and then you do it again and you're better and then you get to where you want to be. And you're like, you know what? I went from A to B and it wasn't too bad. I learned how to do that. And we do that all the time. You know, we have a pandemic and then most of us go, all right, I've got to learn how to do stuff from home. <laughs> so you learn how to set up a ring light and you turn how to plug in a microphone and you learn how to stare at a camera so you're not looking down the, le the lens rather than off to the person. You learn all this sort of stuff and you adapt and you change. It's a little bit like downloading a good app on your phone. You're like, this makes me a little bit smarter, a little bit more efficient, a little a, a little better for who I am. But there are some times when you try and take on change and frustratingly, even though you know how to do this in theory, in practice, you're like, I just can't get going on this. <laughs> and mm. you've read the books and you've listened to the podcast and you've joined Masterclass and you've joined Creative Live and, you, and you've hired somebody and you're like, I can't learn anymore and I'm still stuck. And you've, got, you've mm. downloaded every app that's possible and none of them are making a difference. And when you're dealing with that, you're really dealing with hard change. And hard change isn't additive. Hard mm. change is transformative. And it's nice. instead of an app, you kind of need a new operating system. You know, it's kind of like U plus versus U 2.0 or present U versus future U. They're all kind of metaphors for the same thing, which is, you know, in adult development, you get to the top of your, your S curve and it takes something to take you to break through and leap to the next phase of development. And when you're wrestling with a worthy goal and you're having this moment of commitment, you're actually thinking to yourself, this isn't just additive. If it was additive, I'd already be doing it. This is going yeah. to be transformative in some way. This is unlock my greatness by working on the hard things. I'm unlocking my greatness. So I've got to get clear about what's at risk here so that I can take on what hard change really means. Yeah, some of this sounds a little solitary. You talk also, to, so that's why I think it's important to bring the idea that you can't travel this path of self-actualization alone, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, what is the role of other people in this journey? I'm so glad you said that because I think I'm wired to be a bit solitary about this stuff. I don't know whether it's, again, you know, I'm like, I've got the kind of lone male hero kind of striding over to the off to on the horizon, which is like, I'm going to conquer the world by myself. And I'm like, it turns out every time I've had success, I've, I've had a lot of people around me. I mean, as I reflect on getting to 20 years at box of crayons, I'm like, even though I'm the founder of that, there are just, I'm just one small dot of paint in that story, in that picture. Um, there are so many other people whose energies and opinions and contributions have shaped what that is. You just can't do it alone. Rather than defining specific roles, because every worthy goal is different, it might be about your family or your community or your team or your business or your country. I mean, who knows what scale you're playing at, what level of change you're thinking at. Basically borrowed an idea that I take from North American indigenous wisdom, which is calling in the directions. And, I like that. Uh, when they call in the directions at the start of a meeting, they 
call to the north, or they call to the, the east and the south and the west and the north. And each direction has an energy and a color and a totemic animal and an archetypal energy, an archetypal role. So east is calling in the, the fighter, the warrior. It's about having backbone. It's about having boundaries. It's about drawing the line. It's about pushing back. South is about calling in the, the healer. Or the, or the lover sometimes. And that's about compassion and healing and, and shelter and renewal and vulnerability and messiness. Uh, when you call in the, the energies of the West, that's the, the teacher or the magician. So that's about learning and about knowledge. And then when you call in the North, that's the, the ruler or the visionary. And that's about calling in ambition and looking to the horizon and a, and a ruthlessness as well, I think. Mm. And I think it's useful that when you think about your worthy goal, you're like, what, what energies do I already have for this worthy goal? What energies mm. are worth me calling in? And mm -hmm. partly it's about developing that capacity within yourself. But mm. sometimes you just need people around you as well to do that. You know, when I think about what I'm on at the work I'm on at the moment, I'm often quite good at visionary kind of ruler energy and mostly good at teachery energy, but I'm a bit, I'm a bit <laughs> deficient in lover energy and warrior energy. You know, I'm like, I don't have the backbone that I would like to have. Um, I don't have the compassion for myself that I would like to have. So I'm like, I need some of those people around me to remind me of who I am, to make me feel okay about it, to kind of encourage me to be braver and bolder about defining boundaries for myself. Um, and I'm like, where do you get that from? And sometimes energies can be just in one person, but sometimes you want a collective around you going, this is where I get this sense from so that I can feel more complete in the project that I'm working on. Yeah, I love that. It, it's just, you're an interesting cat to not have a lover or warrior energy. <laughs> yeah. I, have, I, have, I have some of it, but I'm like, you know what? I, it's, it's, uh, and I have my, and I think you have your moments, but when you're doing yeah. something that is, um, on your own edge, where you're learning to be that, your vulnerabilities become more apparent. And I'm like, yeah. oh, you know, there are just times where I roll over too easily, or I say yes too easily, or I, or I don't ask for the help that I really need or I really want. And that's why I have people around me to kind of go, Michael, <laughs> I mean, it's like, I have a mastermind group I've been part of for years. And I have a phase in every single project I work on where I'm like, it's hopeless. I can't do anything. It's so hard. And I can't make any progress. I don't even know what I'm doing. And after 15 years, I go, Michael, you do this every time. <laughs> this, every is exactly, time. this is exactly how you always are at this stage. Yes. So just be nice to yourself. And I'm like, oh, yeah, that's right. I do do that. And they're that, they're that kind of healer or lover energy for me just to go, Michael, just just calm down. <laughs> Just be nice. Yeah. Good. 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 Well, yeah, there's yeah, there's self compassion there that your friends can instill in you, mm -hmm. so you can intern and start internalizing it. That's right. Hopefully, yeah. Is there like a threshold here where like past to some point of the journey that is qualitatively different? Because I know you say that the journey is not straightforward. Is there a threshold at all of the journey where something feels different? I think there is. Well, I think, I mean, it, it's a very archetypal question. You know, the hero's journey is all about... Oh, Scott, you're so archetypal. <laughs> you are so archetypal, darling. Uh, anyway, oh, my this... God. That was so <laughs> archetypal, let me tell you. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. The, you know, hero's journey is like the hero hears the call. She doesn't yeah. answer the call. She hears the right. call again. She finally answers the call. Yes. She crosses the threshold. And yes. and she's and the and it's happening and a journey has begun, and I do feel that you know there's a bunch of writing which is like the hero's journey is not the only journey and it's it's a bit patriarchal and I'm like you know what that's that might be true but it's also a really good archetype and a really good pattern of journeying that lots of people recognize and I do and mm. I do think there's a moment where you commit there's a moment where you cross the threshold. Hmm. And now it gets interesting because now you uh, now you face the doubts and the trials and the tribulations of taking on this worthy goal where you've got 
something that is on the edge of what's possible for you because you've chosen something thrilling and important and daunting and you've fine-tuned it to make sure it's all of that. And so you're like, I don't really know how to do this. Like daunting means you know how to start, but you don't really know how to finish. Um, mm. You know, we have a, a community of people who are working on how to begin worthy goals. And um, tomorrow is our monthly meeting with them. And I'm coaching three of them around that. And I'm coaching them around. This is the misery of being as part of the journey. This is when you're in the in the in the valley in the shadow, and you're like, I, I'm, I'm doubting myself. I'm trying to do too much. I'm trying to do too little. And so I think the bigger answer here is the magic is actually in undertaking the journey because you do all that work to set the goal. <laughs> and yeah. then it's a little bit of almost misdirection because, mm. uh, and you might know this research, you probably do, which is if you spend too much time visualizing your outcome, visualizing your goal, it's actually mm. demotivating. Because the, yeah. because because the brain is not that good at telling the difference between inside and outside. That's the amazingness of our imagination. If you mm. over visualize the success, your brain yeah. goes, "You got it! I, I can taste it. This is amazing. Everybody relax. Everybody stand down because we've arrived." Yeah. Actually, the power is to notice the gap between where you are now and and where you think the goal might be. So yes, 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 you know, yes. You, you unlock your greatness by working on the hard things, not by winning the prize. And so now you start the journey and you're trying to navigate and there'll be moments where you get somewhere and you're like, I need to pivot. I need to change direction. I need to tweak the goal. Turns out it's not that mountain at all. It's that mountain next to it over there. But it's a process of you're, you're in the journey. And what I hope is more people stick with the journey. Now, there's obviously a place that sometimes you're like, it's not a bad idea to abandon something that's not working. But if you've gone through the drafting and you've actually kind of optimized for thrilling, important, and daunting, if you've found mm. people around you, if you've figured out how to travel so you're traveling in small steps rather than trying to do too much too fast, then mm. there's a better chance for you to say, this still matters. So how do I keep going even though this is turning into a bit a difficult part of the journey? Yes, uh, you remind me of uh, that was that was a good soliloquy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that, was, that one was good. No, um, uh, you remind me a little bit of um, Gabrielle Ottingen's research at NYU. She calls um, it, it uh, when you fantasize too much about something, she calls it indulging. Uh -huh. She calls it the, the indulging stage of of a goal attainment. Yeah, and you, you got me thinking about her research on that oh, and her WHOOP yeah. model. You, you, you must have heard of her WHOOP model. I don't think yeah. I have. What, what's the WHOOP model? WHOOP, oh, there it, it is. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> remember that? Do you remember so that you're, like, from the you're like an archetypal disco dancer, and that is a very yeah. small Venn diagram overlap. I'm loving that. <laughs> well, I'm a hip hop, a hip hop dancer. Yeah. Oh, um, there we the, go. The, yeah, I don't know about disco. Um, um, <laughs> anyway, uh, that, that the, shirt, that shirt is a disco I, shirt. I asked. That's true. Oh, that's true. That's a fair point. That's. I'm not. I'm not in my hip hop gear right now. Uh, I do suggest that our listeners uh, Google the Whoop model of goal attainment because it's a whole thing that you can even Perfect. download the app. Um, it whoop stands for wish outcome op obstacle and plan wish outcome obstacle and plan nice. and the wish part is uh, they emphasize is important not to get too stuck on that stage where you start to think that you've obtained it already by indulging yeah, yeah. so anyway that's you know that's uh, she's doing great work and it seems very much in line with what you're talking about okay well let's like kind of end here with the end of the journey. Uh, which I want you to set me straight that I shouldn't even say such words, right? Um, <laughs> is there ever an end to the journey? How should we be thinking about the journey and thinking about mm. the actual moment of goal attainment? Yeah. Is there ever such a moment? Can you can you kind of help me think about this in a good way? Well, look, I I don't I don't touch on that so much on the book because truly in the book I'm like, can I get you can I get you going? Because yeah. how, how the journey plays out, you know, can depend on a lot. But I think if you're lucky, you, you do get to cross a, cross a line and say that I'm done. Like yeah. writing the coaching habit book was a worthy goal for me. It took me years and I finally got the book out in the world. And that was a moment. And I came really close to, to 
you know, ignoring <laughs> whatever advice I give other people, which is, damn it, Jim, stop and celebrate. Stop and actually go, well <laughs> yeah. done. Well done. And, and actually, there's just there's so much to be said in terms of don't just celebrate the big final finish, but it's like keep celebrating the small milestones along the way because yes. it is it is no small thing. You're both doing the work, you're unlocking your greatness, and you've reached something. And if some people are wired like me, which is like quite future oriented, and mm. I come close regularly to missing <laughs> missing the celebration. I'm like, oh good, but who cares? On to the next thing. Never be satisfied. <laughs> and you know, I just you know, if you want to call it back the, the bigger journey never ends, at least I hope not, which is like you're constantly going, what's thrilling, what's important and daunting for me. And you live a life where you're on that edge going, I'm I'm exploring who I am and what this world mm -hmm. is and how I contribute to the world. But I do think that you know, Kevin Kelly, uh, founder of Wired Magazine and uh, mm. a great writer and thinker, really. Um, he he has a, a blog post from a while back at kk.org, which is um, figuring out your death date. It's like, here's mm. when you die. And you can do it with kind of actuarial tables. And he'll tell you roughly kind of, actually specifically, according to actuarial tables, statistically, this is when you die. And that's interesting, but I thought what he said that next was most interesting, which is each big project takes about five years. Now, according to my death date, I've got about 21 years left. It's like uh, September 2043 is, is when I'm allegedly up for it. So I'm like, okay, it's 21 years left. That's like four big projects. You know, choose carefully, Michael. <laughs> you know, you've got some big things ahead of you. What do you want to do that feels yeah. that right combination of thrilling, important, and daunting? Oh, man. Well, um, I wish you all the best of luck. The world needs it. Um, the projects you've done so far are really great. Uh, and you say, you say, quote, we unlock our greatness by working on the hard things, not by winning them. Um, so uh, I hope you keep working. <laughs> That's my coaching <laughs> session for you today. Well, thank uh, you. I'm uh, writing it, it down. It was a, <laughs> thank you. Write it down. Take notes. And I'll hold you accountable. But it was a real honor for me to, as someone who's trying to get more in the coaching world myself, and um, I'm creating this form of coaching calling self-actualization coaching, I'm really learning a lot from you. And I really appreciate your, your humility and curiosity. It's really wonderful. Thank you so much for being on my show today. You know what? It was a thrill to be on the show. I was, I've been wanting to be a guest here for so long. And so this is a culmination of something important for me. So I'm going to go away and celebrate this. <laughs> Thank you. But was it daunting? <laughs> but was it daunting? <laughs> you know, it was a little daunting. I mean, I've done a lot of podcasts, but I felt more daunted by this podcast than I have for any for quite a while. I was like, you know mm -hmm. what? This is, this, I want to show up as best I can for this podcast. Good. So we got the trifecta of thrilling, <laughs> right. important, and daunting. Wonderful. Exactly. Thank you. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Psychology Podcast. If you'd like to react in some way to something you heard, I encourage you to join in the discussion at thepsychologypodcast.com or on our YouTube page, The Psychology Podcast. We also put up some videos of some episodes on our YouTube page as well, so you'll want to check that out. Thanks for being such a great supporter of the show, and tune in next time for more on the mind, brain, behavior, and creativity.